Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing... Steve Goble. Hi there. How are you doing today? I'm great, Molly. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for coming. I'm doing great, too. So, can you tell me about what you've written? Uh, Sure. I write uh, historical mysteries featuring uh, a a reluctant pirate named Spider John and a ever-growing cast of pirate buddies. Awesome. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about your new book coming out as well? Uh, Yeah, Pieces of Eight is uh, coming out in uh, March. It's the fourth book in the uh, Spider John uh, mystery series. And in this one, Spider finally arrives in Nantucket, where he's been trying to to reach for the last three books— uh, he has a wife and a, a child there that he's been trying to get home to. Uh, and in this one, he gets home. Of course, things turn out to be not quite what he expects. Do you think that you're going to continue with this series once this book gets released? I certainly hope so. Um, we're still talking about uh, the future of Spider John uh, between the publishers and my agent and myself. Um, so you mentioned that you write historical fiction. Can you talk a little bit about how you towed the line between historical and fiction, like keeping that proper balance? Uh, sure. Um, primarily, uh, I consider myself more a storyteller than an historian. Uh, so I, I'm hoping people are coming to my books for murder mysteries and piratical adventure and not necessarily using them for research for their history papers. Um, But I do try to keep things uh, as accurate as I can. Um, Mostly I'm writing about fictional characters and fictional happenings, but uh, there will be occasions where uh, actual historical pirates like uh, Anne Bonny or Ned Lowe will either show up directly in the story or be lurking in the background of the story. So I try to keep uh, to uh, accurate events as far as where these people were and what they were doing at the time, um, while primarily focusing on my cast of characters and their problems. Um, it's, uh, it, it's an odd mix. I do a lot of research uh, as far as uh, nautical terms and uh, – read accounts of pirate trials and things like that. So I can get a lot of historical flavor in the story, but primarily I, I'm hoping people are caught up in the characters and the action and the uh, the mystery itself. When you went into writing this series, did you already know a lot about like pirates and that time period in history, or did you have to start completely from scratch? Well, it it was always an interest of mine, and I I think anybody that is going to try to write any kind of uh, historical fiction, you you better start with something that you love. Um, I read Treasure Island uh, as a young boy. It was one of the very first books I fell in love with, and uh, I have enjoyed nautical fiction and uh, nautical history uh, ever since. So, yeah, I, I knew a lot about how pirates operate and who some of the more uh, colorful figures were and, and and a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, And, and so it, it sort of, I I naturally gravitated toward that area. If if I had uh, made a decision to write something about Elizabethan England or something like that, uh, that would never have worked out for me. I just didn't have that uh, familiarity, but with pirates, pirates, it's always been something I've been interested in. So you mentioned Treasure Island as like sort of a catalyst for that love of pirates. Can you cite any other, or were there any other books or authors or just stories in general that kind of inspired these works? Well, sure. Um, Patrick O'Brien wrote a uh, series of historical uh, novels featuring um, a, a naval captain and his spy friend, um, uh, Captain Aubrey and uh, his friend Stephen Maturin. Um, I've read most of those and will get around to reading the rest before I die. They're just absolutely wonderful. Uh, so that's a part of it. But uh, Robert Louis Stevens, Stevenson also wrote Kidnapped and other books. Um, Raphael Sabatini uh, wrote several stories uh, involving pirates, uh, most notable Captain Blood, 
um, which is a, a favorite of mine too. So if it is, uh, if it has pirates in it, I've probably read it. Cool. Um, in your books, did you ever hide any like Easter eggs or homages to those stories or to anything? Um, not so much to those stories. Um, it, every now and then I will, uh, name a, a ship or a character after somebody I've met in real life or, uh, something like that. Uh, Spider John's last name is, uh, Rush, uh, which is uh, a known, uh, family name from, from back in the day. But I named him that because I'm a fan of the band Rush. Oh. Um, so, um, so that's one. And uh, every once in a while, I will sneak a snippet of Beatles lyrics into dialogue. Um, I just love just that. enough so that my close friends will know what I've done. But I don't think most people will notice it. Well, they might now once they well, listen to your <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yes. Well, I, that's such a fun thing. I love talking to authors when they're like, oh, I hid this one in or like Beatles lyrics like. It's so interesting to see how people's interests can play into what they write. Well, yeah, that's part of writing. I think uh, you, you take everything you experience and it all goes into a blender in your brain and it comes out in the keyboard and ends up in your stories. And sometimes I'll I'll write a line and then realize, oh, you know what? That that that's out of uh, one of the Beatles songs, isn't it? And I'll go, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> That can happen to me where I'm like, I just wrote the most perfect line. Oh, wait, that's from something I read five years ago once. Like, Yeah, you have, you have to guard against that kind of thing. Certain things just kind of stick in your brain like that. Yes, they do. So what made you want to be a writer? Uh, reading. Um, it, I, I don't know how anyone can read books uh, as avidly as I do and not want to be part of that world themselves. Um, I, I grew up with uh, not just Robert Louis Stevenson, but uh, the Sherlock Holmes stories and mm -hmm. other adventure stories and, and mysteries. And I've just always wanted to put my own stamp on that kind of thing. Yeah. Did you have any favorite books when you were a kid that like inspired you to write or like they, even that you read now that just kind of like almost give you a pick me up? Oh, sure. Um, uh, aside from Treasure Island, Hound of the Baskervilles was one of the big ones for me, too. Um, I just absolutely loved that book. I mean, you know, mystery and ghost dog and everything else. Mm. Um, that was a big part of it. Um, anytime I read anything by Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, I read science fiction and fantasy stuff, too. I think she's just an amazing writer. And I read her stuff and... Well, sometimes I read her stuff and I want to give up um, because I'm oh. never going to I'm never going to top that. I have um, some authors like that where I read. I'm like, oh, no, I could never do anything like this. Exactly. But but she inspires me at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and a host of other writers, too. Um, probably too many to mention even. But oh, yeah. So do you do you have like a, a favorite book now? Is it still Treasure Island? Like. Yeah, Treasure Island's probably my absolute favorite book of all time. And every four or five years ago, I will read it again. Um, I, it's the best pirate book anyone's ever written, and I don't think anyone's ever going to top it. Um, I just, I love that whole relationship between Jim Hawkins and, and Long John Silver. You know, is mm -hmm. how much can Jim really trust Long John? Is Long John using him? Is he not using him? Um, you know, it's just... It, it's, it's a great book. It's just full of adventure and color and, and you know, it, it shaped my life in a lot of ways. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be writing pirate novels now if it had not been for that book. So, I, I love hearing about when people say, like, how certain books have, like, shaped their lives because stories have the power to do that. Like, they can turn us in a whole other direction. Oh, they, they really do. And, and as far as Treasure Island goes... If I'm in a used bookstore and I find a copy of it, uh, if I don't already have that specific volume, a lot of times I'll go ahead and grab it and, and just to have another copy of, of Treasure Island. It's like I can't see that book and not want to have it in my hands. Yeah. Um, so you have another book coming off, book coming out. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's going to also be a series, right? 
Uh, yes, it is. I, I have a, a three book deal with Ocean View Publishing for a uh, hard boiled detective series. Uh, the first book is called City Problems, and that one comes out in July. So, without spoiling anything, could you tell me a little bit about it? Um, sure. I, I, I mentioned earlier I read all kinds of stuff, um, and, and included in that is hard boiled detective fiction like uh, Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, and, and, and that kind of stuff. And I've always been drawn to those kind of stories as well. Um, this one I wrote sort of in between the Spider John stories. Um, those take me longer to write, a lot of research. Uh, it's third person narrative, and 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 so it's it takes me a while to 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 get one of those done. Um, the city problems is written in first person narrative. Um, it's a modern day story, so the research is nowhere near as heavy. Mm-hmm. And once I finish a Spider John book, I'll uh, take a week or so off, and then I, I started writing this book, um, and uh, it went rather quickly, and and I enjoyed it. Um, it's a, the story of a rural sheriff's detective. Um, I don't know if you've read a lot of hard-boiled uh, detective stories or private eye stories or whatever. A lot of them, uh, the the main character will have some event in his background that led him to, or her, to, to leave the police department and become a private investigator. Um, and I decided for City Problems to write the story of that story rather than have it be background. Oh. Uh, so, so here my cop is uh, confronting a difficult case that um, kind of draws out his personal demons and he's battling himself as much as he's battling the, the case itself. And then by the end of it, it, he's, you know, made a life change based on what he's learned in this book. So I hope people will like it. It's very different from the spider John stuff, but, uh, I enjoy writing it too, and and, and I'm glad that Ocean View has given me a chance to put it out there. Yeah, I think that that's a really inventive take on that sort of genre of the, that type of book, like switching it around so that way you hear the backstory first. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's almost uh, – th- this one's almost – if you took a police procedural like, a, uh, like Ed McBain is famous for writing and – blended it with a Raymond Chandler and brought it into the modern day Ohio farm country. Um, this is the book you might end up with. Oh, that sounds so cool. Um, so the setting from that is wildly different than pirate novels. How, what were some of like the differences in like switching your brain over almost for writing, like making sure it was totally different? Well, that, that week, between uh, working on Spider John and, and working on uh, Ed Runyon as the main character in, in the new series, uh, the, the time between those books is very important. I have to sort of just get out of pirate mode um, a- entirely. And uh, I'm the kind of writer, I can't sit in front of a blank screen and wonder what I'm going to write. I have to have a very clear idea of the next chapter or at least the beginning of that next chapter in my head before I even sit down. Um, so I'm, I might go days without touching the keyboard while I'm working things out. And, and so I, I'll finish a Spider John book and it, it'll definitely be a week or two before I even touch the, the keyboard again. Um, but then when I do, I'm, I'm ready to go with, with the Ed Runyon stuff. It's, um, it's easier for me because it's a first person narrative. And I think I naturally lean towards that way uh, as a writer. Um, I don't have to look up the etymology of every third word to make sure it was still being used in 720, oh, 1722. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, occasionally I'll have Spider and his friends decide to eat something and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. If you were in the New England in 1722, could you easily get that food item? Or, you know, it, there's a lot of research with the Pirate John stuff or, or the Spider John stuff with uh, Ed. I know he can swing by McDonald's and, and what he can get to eat. So yeah. um, it, it, it's, it's, it's definitely turning my brain on a different gear, but it's a more natural gear for me. So um, I, I enjoy it. The, the, the surprising thing for me was that uh, I have two books coming out in the first half of the year. Uh, and that's mostly because of COVID. Uh, ordinarily the spider John book would have released in uh, 
November of last year. Oh, yeah. um, but COVID kind of threw everything for a loop. So it's coming out later. And then uh, my agent was able to solve city problems faster than I thought he could. So bless him for that. Um, and they had a spot on their schedule. So I have two books to get ready for. Nice. Yeah, yeah it's I a good problem to have. <laughs> all of these, everyone, go read all of his books, 100%. These, oh, they all sound so cool. Um, so the Spider John books are not in first person, correct? No, no, no. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not. Uh, Spider himself is illiterate. He, he can't read or write. And if I tried to tell an entire story using his voice and accent and dialect or whatever, I think it would be it's very difficult for me to write it. And it yeah. would probably be difficult for people to read it. Um, I might be able to pull off a short story uh, in, in that vein, and maybe someday I will. But to carry that out for the length of a novel, uh, that's more work than I want to do. I definitely understand that. Yeah. Um, so what are some of like, the differences and similarities between writing in first person and in third person for novels like that? Um, well, third person, uh, you have more work ahead of you, I think, in, in a lot of ways, um, you, you have to decide how, how deeply to get into the character's head. Um, for the Spider John books, I, I'm writing in third person, but everything is from his point of view. And I do that because it's a mystery and I want the readers to get the clues at the same time and in the same way that Spider does. So, when other characters talk to Spider, if there's a clue in that dialogue, the reader gets it when Spider does. Um, and so I have to sometimes jump through some narrative hoops because I'm, I'm not giving myself the freedom to tell a chapter from some other character's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's so everything is as Spider gets it. Uh, the other thing with the third person narrative I ha is I have more leeway for dis description which I think is important for the historical novels because most of my readers will not have spent any time on a pirate ship or uh, significant time out to sea. So I have to kind of describe these things and try to tease the reader into that time and place. Uh, with the first person stuff, um, there's less description. Um, a person telling a story, like me telling you a story right now, I might tell you something that my wife said or did today, but I'm not going to stop and describe the color of her eyes, the color of her hair, what she was wearing, the shape of her body, blah, blah. Every part know. of the room that you were standing in. like Right. Yeah. Yeah. Human beings don't do that. So in, in first person, I'm trying to keep it a very natural voice. And uh, so I'll have Ed, if he describes someone at all, it'll be in terms of what is unusual about them. You know, this character has a, nose shaped like a potato or whatever, or, um, I noticed this guy was bigger than me and wondered if I could take him in a fight, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, it, but trying to keep it more natural. So it's, it's two very different gears. And, um, I, I think I'm doing okay with them both. Readers will decide that of course, but, uh, do, do it, it keeps me jumping. Do you think that in the future of your writing, like if you were to start a different series which one would you gravitate towards more or would you go into something like more like second person or something like that? Um, I, you know, I, I don't think I would go with second person. I, I, I know a lot of people are doing that and uh, some people can pull it off rather well. Uh, I find it annoying as a reader when, when I'm reading a story in second person, even if it is done well. So I, it's just, I don't think it would be natural for me and I don't think it's anything I would try. As far as um, choosing a narrative voice, uh, I think I would lean towards first person because it's more natural for me. But uh, it would depend on what I'm writing. You know, if, if it, the, the story kind of has to demand what you're you're going to do with it, um, th there's a right voice for one kind of story. There's a, a better voice for another kind of story. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a difficult question to answer. It's a, an interesting question. Yeah. Like I've had at least two different stories that I had started writing that totally changed partway through. Or like I wrote the whole thing then I went back and completely rewrote it from another perspective. So like Oh wow. Yeah. 
So, like, I get how that could just totally be different depending on the book. Yeah. Now, I, I do a similar thing with all of my books. I don't write it that way. But after I finish a chapter, I look at that chapter again and I write it again in my head from the vantage point of each and every minor character. So, for instance, uh, I might write a, a chapter where uh, Spider John learns something important uh, regarding the plot. Um, but then after I've written that chapter, I will write it again in my head from the vantage of his young friend, Hob. And, okay, well, why would Hob think about this? How would he react to this? Uh, and I'll do that for every other character in line. And what I often find out is that uh, were it not for that technique, I miss narrative opportunities. Um, your minor characters can really complicate your story in unique and wonderful ways if you give them the chance. But uh, if, if, if I don't go back and look at that chapter through the lens of their eyes, I don't necessarily see that, well, oh, you know, what? when Hob hears that, he's going to be up set probably because his goals are different from spiders so he's going to get in spider's face and and talk to him about that or he's going to decide to not you know follow orders and and propel my authorial plot along the way i want it to go he's going to go do his own thing uh it's a great technique and i've employed it with uh most of my books i, I recommend uh, other writers out there to give it a try i think you'll find out things about your characters that will really help your books along. I find that so fascinating. I'm definitely going to have to try that. Um, so does that, I would also assume that that helps you understand how much every character knows too, because like different characters have different information. Yes, it does. And, and I, I keep notes on uh, what characters know what uh, and, 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 and that kind of thing. It, it's more important for the, the potential suspects uh, in terms of what I'm writing than, than for Spider and his friends. But it does help to, to know who knows what and where they were and what they were doing. Um, it, 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 yeah, it's, especially with mysteries, I think it's just necessary to, to keep those kind of timelines and flow charts and, and know what's going on. Yeah. Do you have any other writing tips for young writers who are writing like mysteries or historical fiction or anything like that? Um, probably the, the number one tip I give anyone is uh, don't chase trends. Um, you know, just because one type of novel is popular this year or this decade, don't just go out and try to write the way uh, J.K. Rowling writes or the way somebody else writes. Write the stories that only you can tell and the stories that you love best, whether you think there's an audience out there for it or not. Because I think if you do that, you'll do your best work and you'll have your best chance at connecting with people who like the same kind of thing you're producing. Uh, you'll you'll become a unique voice and, and your own thing. Uh, don't Don't try to be the next Stephen King. You know, be the first whoever you are. That's really excellent advice. I hope that everyone listening to this really takes that to heart. Um, <laughs> I hope so too. It's also funny as soon as you said don't take chase like the popular writing trends, my first thought was Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> uh well, yeah, I I've, I've um, talked to a lot of young writers who want to write the next Harry Potter book and 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 some of them will, you know, people, you know, if that's what you love, that's what you should be writing. That that kind of material. But if you're doing it just from a marketing standpoint, you know, if you're looking back and saying, boy, I want to be a writer and uh, that JK, she made a lot of money doing this. I'm going to write the same kind of thing. You're not going to do it as well as she does. And you're not going to do it as well as somebody who loves it. And I was going to say, you probably won't be happy with the end product because you're not really putting that element of yourself into it. That is probably true. And agents probably won't be happy with the end product either. And neither will publishers. Well, oh, I've read this before. Um, you, you know, you you, you got to be yourself, whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. Okay, so this question's a little bit different than what we were just talking about. But do you have a favorite scene that you've ever written? Oh, wow. Uh, I saw that question uh, earlier when, when we were setting this up. I, I don't have a favorite scene. 
Um, there are one or two contenders that I might talk about that I write mysteries and I don't like spoiler alerts. So I'm not going to go into details on that. Oh, yeah. But I, I can say that my favorite scenes to write, um, it, it, especially with the Spider John books, are the scenes where Spider and his young swashbuckling friend Hob and his uh, buddy Odin, who's his crusty old ancient pirate who's survived the rough life of piracy way longer than the odds would suggest. Uh, when the three of them are putting their heads together, trying to f- figure out what's going on with the case and spiders trying to keep everything, you know, within the realm of actual possibility. And Hobb is suggesting that, well, maybe ghosts did it. Um, oh. and, and Odin will pick a fight with Hobb and then smack each other in the face. When those three characters are together, those are my favorite scenes to write. One of the nice things about uh, writing uh, murder mysteries in the age of piracy is it was a supernatural age. And uh, while, you know, I, as a writer, I'm not going to throw actual ghosts into my mystery plot. I, that's against the rules. If you're trying to write a fair mystery, my characters are free to believe in ghosts all they want to. And uh, they can suggest that kind of thing. And uh, it, it, it can get interesting and, and it's fun for me to write. And I hope it's fun for people to read. Yeah. I love that sort of character dynamic too. Like when they just play off of each other so well. Do you remember the moment when you finished your first book? <laughs> I, I remember the moment when I thought, okay, I'm ready to uh, try to uh, land an agent for this. I don't know if I could actually say that, it was finished, finished, because my theory on any book is until someone cuts a check and says, we're going to publish this, I'm still working on it. Um, I give myself freedom to to edit and update and uh, and work on it right up until, uh, you know, I have a book deal and somebody says, OK, I like this. And, and my first book, The Bloody Black Flag, was very much in that vein. I was uh, shopping it around to agents while I was still tinkering with uh, things uh, toward, especially towards the end of the book. Um, but I do remember feeling that, okay, this, this is solid. This is an idea that I think somebody might want to read. Um, and I told a good friend of mine, you know, what I was working on. I said, murder mystery on a pirate ship. And his eyebrows went up and he nodded his head. And I thought, okay, I've got this. There, there's an audience for this out there. Uh, and that was a good feeling. I, it was, that was wonderful. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's so exciting too. Like I, I can only imagine like how incredible it must feel to be like, okay, yeah, yeah. You're going to get an agent for that. Um, well, well, and, and then yeah. I, I did get an agent. And uh, the first thing he said was, we need to work on the end of this book. Uh, <laughs> oh. he said, if, I, if I'm going to take you on, I, I, I think you're, you, you've solved the crime too far away from the end of the book. You need to alter things. So um, I, and I thank him for that, too. I have a better ending for the first book than I had when I sent it to him. So a good agent won't just sell your book. A good agent will you know, help you fix your book, too. Yeah. It's yeah. a team effort. That's, that's really good. And I think that that's good advice for any writers listening as well. Like, make sure to find someone who will – help you like not and oh. not just automatically accept it oh absolutely i uh um i have i'm, I'm very fortunate uh, my wife is a a, a good writer and a, and a avid reader and uh my best friend is a, a writer and a, a reader as well and they both care enough about me to read my stuff and say this isn't working or this could be better and uh, that's incredibly important you know your your, your mom or your your wife or your boyfriend or whatever they might read it and say, wow this is great but if they're not writers and they're not readers and they don't really know how to help you make it better that's just feeding your ego what you need is someone to say why in the hell did you write this this way mm-hmm. or you know this this dialogue just doesn't sound real steve what's going on uh my wife does that for me my friend tom does that for me and uh they, they both make my books better than i can make them so Yes. Find someone who loves you enough to tell you when you're screwing it up. And I don't know if you experience this as much, but as a writer, all of my, like, everything that I write is, like, my precious, like, thing. Like, I don't, 
I don't usually see as many flaws in it. <laughs> and then people are like, no, okay, no, you need to fix this part. And then I can feel free to do that. But like, I feel like that's something that can happen with writers a lot where it's like writing goggles it, on. Yeah, it, it can happen. And I do the golem thing where one night I think this is my precious. This is great. And then the next time I look at it is, this is stupid. It burns us. You know, oh, it's, same. Uh, I do that with so everything. I, I go back and forth and like, you know, well, yeah, Steve, you got this. You're pretty good at this stuff. And then the next day it's like, this is nowhere near as good as you thought it was when you went to bed last night. Um, and so I, I resolve most of that myself before I show it to my wife and before I show it to Tom. Mm -hmm. um, I show it to the two of them before I show anyone else in the world. But by the time I show it to them, I feel like I've done a pretty good job. Um, and they do, and they still find things in there that, uh, I could have done better. Um, so bless them both for that. But yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Some nights I love it. And some nights I wonder why I do this. Oh yeah. I have that in <laughs> a lot of areas where it's just like, oh my gosh. And sometimes it can even be like the same day. It's just, what? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's a tricky business, uh, trying to write a book and, uh, you know, it's, one of the nice things about the, the writing community, I, you know, you reach out to other people and say, hey, look, you don't know me, but I wrote this book. And could you maybe write something nice about it for the cover of my book? And you feel, you know, horrible asking, but they've been there, too. And I've, I've asked, you know, writers that I had no right at all to, to ask uh, to write a blurb. And, and they're like, yeah, sure, because they know how hard this is. And they've been there and they had to ask somebody for blurbs. And it's just. It's a very welcoming community, um, and I've also had uh, the same writers, you know, read my book and and and, and give me a nice jacket quote, and then say, "By the way, I kind of think you could have done this better," <laughs> um, so, which, which is great. I love that kind of feedback and help. But it, it's a great community. It's a great thing to be part of, and I feel like I'm just lucky to be allowed to play around in this world with the grownups. Yeah. Um, well. Thank you so much for coming on. I just have one final question for you today. And that okay. is, what do you have coming up? Well, I'm working on uh, the second book in the uh, Ed, Run Ed Runyon series now and uh, up against a uh, May deadline for that. And then I'll be working on another Spider John novel. And uh, mostly that, trying to stay away from COVID and squeeze in enough family time as uh, as i can mm -hmm. all right well i wish you luck with all of that um once again i had a great time here with you today i enjoyed it too molly thank you very much of course thank you for read between the lines my name is molly southgate i'm steve goble let's end this the way all great stories end happily ever after the, the end, end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. This episode is hosted by Molly Southgate. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group. You can get in touch with the show at readbetweenthelines at gmail.com or you can send us a voicemail at 708-887-9473. That was 708-887-9473. You can also find us on Instagram at readbetweenthelinespodcast. Thank you so much for listening.